She was the largest, fastest, and most powerful of all the ocean liners. She was extravagant beyond compare, and she hearkened to a future yet more glorious than the people of her time even dared imagine. She was the pride of France. She was the capstone of the age of steamships, and she was an icon of the interwar years for as long as they lasted. All things considered, she was utterly magnificent. The illustrious life of the SS Normandy was one for the history books, both in terms of the tremendous feat of engineering that it was to build her, and in terms of the effect that she had on the seas for the years that she sailed them. And the tragedy of the SS Normandy, though less often told than that of the Titanic or the Lusitania, was one of the greatest tragedies in the history of the great ocean liners. This, in full, is the story of the SS Normandy, perhaps the greatest steamship ever built. The decade or so prior to World War I was the heyday of ocean liner design, from the Olympic class of ships to the Mauritania and the Lusitania and many more. But for all those ships' glitz and glamour, the ships that survived long enough began to show their age during the 1920s. Today I want to tell you about AG1 by Athletic Greens, the nutritional drink that has become an absolutely essential part of my daily routine. AG1 takes all of those products, littering and shelf, multivitamins, pre and probiotics, and more, and they condense it into one convenient scoop, which you take from the bag, you put in the shaker, you shake it up, and you're good to go. I have it every morning with my coffee, and I feel it kind of just extends my energy throughout the day. It kind of adds to that little dose of caffeine I get with the coffee. It makes me feel a bit healthier. It makes me more healthy, which is nice. But it's not just about getting all of the vital nutrients that your body needs. It's also an investment in your health and your well-being. And about the taste, well, surprisingly delicious. It's got hints of pineapple and a touch of vanilla. Honestly, I didn't know what it was before. I was always just like, yeah, it tastes pretty good. I'll taste it. But now that they told me it's pineapple and vanilla, I'm like, oh yeah, there it is. And also, way better than multivitamins. Anyone else take those multivitamins? They taste horrible. And then if you burp like 20 minutes later, <laughs> too much information, it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah! Oh! Not with AG1. No, no, no. Head to athleticgreens.com forward slash megaprojects or click the link below and you'll get a one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 and also five free travel packs so you can stay healthy on the go. You can't put a price tag on your health. There's a link below. Thank you to AG1 for sponsoring and now back to today's video. During the last half of the decade, US restrictions on immigration had led to significantly lower demand for less wealthy passengers who had used ocean liners to make transatlantic passage to America. At the same time, though, demand was swelling for high-class tourism aboard these same liners, and the ships built prior to World War I just weren't attractive enough anymore to do the job. In France, the company CGT, or if you prefer the French, the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, was doing good business with its ocean liner fleet, which included ships like the Rochambeau and the SS France. But CGT was looking to get in on the next generation of superliners, and they began to draw plans for what their fleet's next evolution might look like. Modeled after their flagship at the time, the Ile de France, CGT knew that they wanted a ship designed in the Art Deco style of interiors, but the specifics remained somewhat muddy for a while. CGT's vision gained a lot more clarity with the arrival of one Vladimir Yorkovich, a Russian former naval architect who found his way to France after the Russian Revolution. During his time in France, he had found work as a ship designer by a French shipyard in the Bay of Saint-Nazaire, and in his time there, he had already been at work sketching out designs for a new ocean liner. His work included several changes to the norms of ship design, including a slanted bow, an underwater bulbous forefoot, and a narrow slicing hull, all meant to improve speed and efficiency on the sea. The engineers at CGT were impressed by Jorovich's concepts, and uh, they sent him to Germany to run some experiments on how well the designs worked in scale models. Using a 28-foot scale, his ship was able to deal with simulated storms and high waves exactly as calculated. And when he reported back to France with what he'd learned, CGT agreed that his design would form the basis of their ship. Although the entire world was embroiled in the harsh years of the Great Depression, CGT was able to weather that financial storm with the help of government subsidies, thanks to an administration that apparently saw significant value in developing the ship despite her enormous price tag. The ship, as yet unnamed, would eventually be the flagship of CGT's fleet. And to hear French newspapers of the time tell it, the ship was to be France's great representative in the ocean liner competition between nations. 
As such, no critical part of her development would be outsourced. Building would take place in France, and the ship would be assembled from materials manufactured there. In her early years, the ship was known as the T-6. Later, she was given the name Normandy, in tribute to the same region of France that would host the D-Day landings not much more than a decade later. During the construction process, builders and engineers were working at a staggering scale for their time, including building one room in the future dining hall, which a 1932 issue of Popular Mechanics described as the largest room afloat. The ship's design also necessitated her funnels to be moved to the ship's port and starboard sides, rather than up the center line of the ship as was traditional. Her hull was built in a shape that no ship of her size had ever endeavored to use, and her deck was built curved in order to offset the impact of water pressing in on either side of the narrow hull. The builders also integrated microphone technology to relay information, as well as an onboard telephone system, both of which were elements that prior ocean liners had not included. The ship was so big that her dry dock even had to be custom built, and it's known today as the Louis Gibert Loch. In front of a cheering crowd of 200,000, the SS Normandy was launched on the 29th of October 1932. As she slid into the water, she displaced enough of a wave that hundreds of spectators were washed over, although nobody was hurt in the incident. While in the water, she was fitted out and made into a working vessel, and two and a half years later, she passed her emergency trials. On May 29, 1935, the ship embarked on her maiden voyage to New York City. She arrived after just four days, three hours, and two minutes. This just barely broke a world record known as the Blue Ribbons, which had previously been held by the Italian ship Rex, and when the Normandy came back to France shortly afterwards, she broke the record heading in the other direction, too. The Normandy was an absolutely massive vessel, with a gross register tonnage of 79,280 tons in 1935, increasing to 83,000 tons a year later. She displaced 63,350 tons from the water, placing her on par with some of the largest naval ships in history. She had a length of 1,029 feet, 313 and a half meters from bow to stern, with a beam width of 36 meters or 118 feet, and a height of 56 meters, 184 feet, with half that making up the hull and half making up the upper decks. The ship was powered by four revolutionary turboelectric engines with four propellers with a maximum power of 200,000 horsepower. She was meant to travel at speeds of up to 29.5 knots and set her trial speed record at 32.2 knots. She was fitted with radar to prevent collisions, and for her size, she was among the quietest and most efficient ships that the world had ever seen. And then there's the ship as the passengers saw her. 1,972 passengers to be exact, including 848 in first class, 670 in Doris class, and 454 in third class, all spread across 12 decks and waited on by 1,345 crew members. As had been the original intent, the Normandy had been fitted out in Art Deco style, with architect Pierre Pateau taking the lead in her interior. The ship included several vast indoor spaces, including her dining hall, her theater, and other public space, and another architect, Roger Henri Expert had fitted the walls with art, alluding to the province of Normandy or otherwise depicting the same sort of massive elegant rooms that Normandy featured on board. First class passengers enjoyed amenities like a staggered depth swimming pool and a lounge, while everyone on board got to enjoy a winter garden featuring exotic birds and the kids on board were treated to their own children's dining room. The Normandy's interiors were defined by their sweeping perspectives, their grand staircases, and for first class passengers, luxurious and completely unique cabins with all the trappings of home, if not more. Two apartments were the best of all of them, with four bedrooms each, private dining facilities, servants' quarters, and a private terrace. The first class dining hall was nearly 100 meters long, with a capacity to fit 700. It was built of hammered glass and bronze, with ceilings three decks tall, and naturally as representative of French culture, the Normandy's chefs were among the foremost artists in French cuisine. Elsewhere on board, a grill doubled as a nightclub, and guests could use a chapel, outdoor swimming pools, or her regulation-sized tennis court as they please. The ship's design had been incredibly detailed. Every piece of machinery or ducting that didn't explicitly have to be visible was hidden away. Her intricate lighting system, especially in the main dining hall, gave her the nickname the Ship of Light, a moniker that the Normandy's architects and designers were no doubt proud to receive. Normandy enjoyed an illustrious first few months on the seas as the biggest and most marvelous ship a person could have the privilege of boarding. 
But it wasn't long before a competitorship took to the seas. The Queen Mary, flown under the British flag and slightly one-upping the Normandy in terms of her tonnage. To deal with this, CGT added an enclosed tourist lounge that conveniently increased the Normandy's tonnage to just enough to solidly reclaim the title. But it wasn't just tonnage for which the Normandy and the Queen Mary were facing off. It was also for the Blue Ribbon record that the Normandy had captured during a maiden voyage. In 1936, the Queen Mary took the prize by just a hair, and not long after, the Normandy would take it back. During her years at sea, the Normandy was a favorite of high-class passengers the world over, who were taken by her elegance and scale. Ernst Hemingway, Walt Disney, and the Von Trapp family were among her most esteemed passengers, further elevating the popularity and esteem of the ship herself. By all accounts, the Normandy was a critical hit with the entire world. She was truly revolutionary. And though her planned sister ship, the SS Breton, was never built, the Breton would have been even larger upon completion. But the Normandy's time at sea wasn't all champagne and escargot. Despite nearly universal agreement that the ship was indeed a success, CGT's preference for first-class passengers had led less wealthy individuals to prefer to travel aboard the Queen Mary and other traditionally mixed-class ships. This perception was especially strong among Americans, who tended to believe that the Normandy was meant for the famous, while the Queen Mary had been designed in a way that made them feel famous. As a result, the Normandy largely missed out on revenues that should have come from her tourist class and third class tickets. In reality, the ship was rarely over 60% occupancy in terms of passengers. This wasn't a problem exclusive to the Normandy. Other extravagant ocean liners at the time also had a tough time turning a profit. Relative to them, at least, the Normandy was able to cover her own expenses. The same couldn't be said of some of her competitor ships. And even the rich and famous weren't totally at ease within the Normandy either. Although sailing was smooth and the amenities were certainly satisfactory, the Art Deco style of the interiors was found to be almost intimidating by many on board. Some passengers even complained of headaches. If you ever looked at a painted portrait only to feel like the eyes are following you, well, imagine that feeling coming from everything around you, except you're at sea with nowhere to escape to. As a result of this effect, the Normandy didn't lose her reputation, but she also didn't get many repeat passengers. On September the 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany declared war on Poland and the entire balance of the world shifted on its axis. Two days later, France declared war on Germany. But of the civilian ships France would now be able to leverage for its own naval defense, the Normandy wouldn't be among them. At the time, she had been moored in New York Harbor and she was interned by the United States as soon as France declared war. By the United States' logic, if the Normandy would have gone into service as a French ship, then she would have quickly become a German ship. And such a big one that the US simply couldn't stomach the possibility. Not long after, the Queen Mary arrived at the same harbor, and soon after that, the newer ocean liner, Queen Elizabeth, came to join them. For months, these three unlikely bedfellows would try and wait out the violence side by side, defended by the US Coast Guard as it attempted to shield the Normandy from any acts of sabotage. But after a little over two years of waiting for a resolution, the Normandy was requisitioned by the US Navy just days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The French crew, who had so far been able to stay and man their ship, were removed, and with them went important technical information on how to safely run the ship. She was approved for transfer to the Navy and designated for conversion into a troop ship under the new name, the USS Lafayette, in honor of the French General Marquis de Lafayette, who was a critical ally to the colonists during the American Revolution. The Navy had initially considered taking the time to make the Normandy into an aircraft carrier, considering her size, but she ultimately was kept as a transport vessel. Worked on by a crew of 458 men, the Lafayette, no longer the Normandy, was slowly converted to a troop ship with potential to carry up to 18,000 on board. The process wasn't easy by any means. American engineers had little familiarity with the ship's design or layout, and some major architectural elements would have to be redone or eliminated entirely. The work continued steadily for a couple of months until orders from Washington pushed up the timeline for the Lafayette's completion date dramatically. Tragically, this rush order would at least be partially responsible for what happened next. At half past two, on February the 9th, 1942, a welder named Clement Derrick accidentally caused a stack of flammable life vests to ignite, and the ship's varnished woodwork, itself highly flammable, quickly turned into kindling. This shouldn't have doomed the ship. The Normandy had been equipped with a fire protection system, and her crew had ample knowledge on their own policies and procedures for fire prevention. But the workmen, now in charge on the Lafayette, 
didn't know that, and the fire protection system had been deactivated with no work done in advance to make it compatible with New York's fire hose inlets in case of emergency. For 15 minutes, onboard crew were forced to do their best to stop the fire manually, but the prevailing winds ensured that the ship's upper decks were consumed in flames. Fireboats pumped water in through the side of the ship, but due to her design, this only caused her to list dangerously to one side. Water sprayed from hoses just added to the problem. The people at the scene simply weren't knowledgeable enough to avoid the issue entirely, and although the one man in the world who knew the Normandy better than anyone, her designer Vladimir Yorkovich, was actually in New York City at the time, he was rewarded for his efforts to get to the port by being barred by police from entering. Yorkovich attempted to explain that since the ship was close to the seabed inside the harbor, her lower decks could be flooded and the ship could stabilize, but his insights were ignored. Five hours after the fire started burning, it was considered under control, but by now the ship was flooding too badly to be stopped. Just after midnight, the rear admiral in command ordered all hands off the vessel, and a few hours later, she rolled to her port side and capsized. In a moment of panic over his role in the disaster, that same rear admiral ordered that the press could not document the tragedy. 94 sailors, 38 firefighters, and 153 civilians were injured in the incident, and one man, fire watchman Frank Trentacosta, was killed. The capsizing of the Lafayette caused outrage in New York and France, amidst wide speculation that the ship had been sabotaged. In reality, the situation was, as a congressional investigation later reveals, the fire had simply been an accident. But incompetence, carelessness, rule violations, and a rushed conversion had all convened to make that fire into a nightmare. After the fact, New York's mobsters attempted to take credit for the incidents, but none were ultimately taken seriously. Eventually, the ship was righted, with the hope that she might become a ferry. But that didn't happen. The whole damage was too severe, and there weren't enough laborers available to put her back into sailing shape. When the war ended, President Harry Truman signed off on the disposal of the Lafayette. To add insults to an already profound injury, the Normandy was valued at a scrap value of just $161,000 or $2.5 million in today's money. Despite protests and attempts to find an alternative spearheaded by Vladimir Yorkovich, neither the US Navy nor the French government nor anyone else expressed interest in the wreck except a New York-based salvage company. By New Year's Day 1949, the world's most magnificent steamship had been fully dismantled. The Normandy was no more. After the wreck, the Normandy's legacy has lived on across the world. Many of the ship's art pieces are highly valued today, and some sit in the world's foremost art museums, while much of her silverware and chairs have survived. Bits and pieces of the ship, including a thousand-pound bronze sculpture, have made their way around the world, while her steam whistle has made the rounds in the U.S. Mid-Atlantic region. The ship's design has been the inspiration for Disney Cruise Line's modern-day vessels, none of which, thankfully, have had to suffer the same fate. So there she is. A short-lived, dismantled ocean liner, one that was both ahead of her time and perhaps not long for this world. In her heyday, she was the greatest thing on the high seas, a majestic sight to behold, and a feat of engineering that rivals any of the greatest maritime vessels in history. Today, she's but a memory, yet nonetheless, she is a memory that will endure for a very long time to come.